Hi, I'm James Swanick. Welcome to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle. And today we're talking to Sarah Connolly, who is an alcohol free living advocate. She's 19 months alcohol free. She is the owner and founder of Sober Upside, which is a website for alcohol free living. And she has a wonderful Instagram account where you can follow her at, at sober underscore Similia. No, Similia. I was going to get that wrong. Sober underscore Similia. Similia. How am I getting it wrong? Sarah, help me out here, will you? Sober underscore Similia, but it's L I E R. Okay, great. The there you end. go. Every, every listener now knows exactly where to go because I butchered it three times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that extra plug, James. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, just for, just for dramatic effect. Sarah, tell us a little bit about you. I, I know you're, you live in Brisbane, Australia, but you're from the UK and you're 19 months alcohol free. Just share a little bit about yourself and your journey, will you? Yeah, I've been in Australia for 21 years, so um, I'm hanging on to my English accent as best I can, but um, I know I've got a twang, so uh, forgive me for that. Um, But um, yeah, I came to the decision quite a long time ago that alcohol was really not good for me, Um, way longer than when I actually, before I made the decision to actually give up. I knew it was stopping me from moving forward in my life. I had all the info. I knew everything about what it was doing to me, but I just didn't have the guts or the courage or the tools at the time to take the step. Um, I tipped over the edge with my drinking in 2019. Um, My father got a very aggressive cancer, which gave him uh, a maximum six months to live. And during that time, um, I was traveling to and from the UK. I was running my business, which um, I run pretty much on my own. I have my two small children, a husband, and I was juggling life. And I was dealing with an incredibly difficult time with my dad. So at that point, alcohol was a really easy go-to for me to numb out all the anxiety and the pain that I was feeling at the time. And so I started drinking more than I normally would. And I kind of watched myself spiral during that time. All the time, I suppose, knowing that it had to stop. And I kind of allowed myself that time when he was really sick and when I was dealing with all of that, just to kind of free fall. Um, Because I knew at some point it had to end. I didn't know when, but I knew. Um, Just to give a context, my dad was an alcoholic when I was a young, when I was growing up. He was a very um, angry man. And um, over the course of his life, he he definitely mellowed and we got a really good relationship towards the end. But he did explain a lot of regret and remorse towards the end in his final days. Um, Wished he'd lived his life a bit differently. And I remember very clearly on the day that he died, making that decision, enough is enough. I do not want to die with regrets. I do not want to die thinking that I didn't live my best life. Um, And it was just a a really clear moment. I got back to Australia. I went straight to my GP. I had no idea what to do. Um, Even back then, the alcohol-free space was relatively new. I kind of thought I had AA or... I didn't know what else, you know, just do it on my own, which I'd done before months at a time, but I'd never managed to to maintain it. Uh, My GP told me about a two-week program, um, which was essentially a rehab. And honestly, James, I did not think that I was a candidate for that kind of extreme measure. But uh, I went to see the psychiatrist anyway, and he was very pragmatic. And he said, look, you can come in, you're not, you know, we would call you an upstream problem drinker, Um, but come on in, do the two weeks and and you'll be fine. And it was just kind of like that. And I thought, okay, bugger it. Why not? I'll go in. It's two weeks away from my kids and (laughs) give me a bit of a break (laughs) more than anything um, after having dealt with the death of my dad and all that sort of drama. Um, And so that's what I did. And I, I went in for two weeks in October of last year. October of 2020. Sorry, 2019. 20, yeah, 2019. 2019 yeah. yeah. So, so you did what is commonly referred to as inpatient rehab. Correct. Got it. Okay, and that you did that for two weeks, yeah. and that ended up being effective for you. 
It absolutely worked, 100%. Um, but I think I went in with the mindset of this is this is my chance. I'm going to be two weeks where I cannot drink. It's not going to be available to me. And I've got two weeks to work on the mental things that I knew I needed to work on. And I knew that I had to switch from valuing alcohol to not valuing alcohol. That was my goal. I wanted to learn why I shouldn't place so much value on it. And a big part of that was surrounding myself with people who were a lot further down the path than I was. Um, and seeing that was, was a lot of motivation to stop. Mm. Um, let's just talk about the rehab that you did for a few minutes, if we may. Just, I'm sure we have lots of listeners who are curious or maybe they've explored the idea of doing rehab and that just sounds like a nightmare to them, like, oh, I'm, there's no way I'm going to do that. It was obviously effective for you. Can you just explain what happens in an inpatient rehab? You stay there for two weeks. Uh, there are other people who I'm assuming are true addicts, I guess, like true uh, physically addicted a lot of serious problems, but don't let me, you know, um, suggest that's the case. Why don't you just share with us? Like, w what is it like? Um, it's not like the movies, at least the one I went into it wasn't. Um, it's a hospital on two floors, a private hospital. And um, I went in, I was body searched. They watched me go to the bathroom. They checked my bags. Um, I was very much treated as if I was a serious addict. I was breath tested, bloods, everything done to check that I hadn't gone in with any alcohol in my system because they wouldn't have admitted me at the time. And it was at that moment where I thought, I'm so in the wrong place. Um, they started to offer me Valium to cope with the, the shakes that I would inevitably experience. And I explained to them that I really didn't feel that that was necessary for me. I had to do a lot of work in there to explain my situation um, because, they, as you say, James, they're very used to people going in that are in serious trouble. Um, and the first three days are the detox days, as I'm sure you would know, um, where people can actually get really sick for that three-day period. Um, I was not in that basket, so um, but it was good to to know that that was potentially something that could happen to me if I didn't sort myself out. Um, <clears throat> and then there was no groups, like there was no sitting down sharing, I'm an alcoholic and this is my problems and these are all the terrible things I've done. There was none of that. It was very much like going, I, I kind of equate it a bit like university. They had lectures every day. Um, that were you were encouraged to attend and you sat and you listened to an expert who gave you lots of different information from talking about you know, obviously the effects of substance because I was in there not just with alcoholics. There were um, uh, marijuana addicts, um, coke addicts, you know, you name it, they were there. And um, we would sit and talk about addiction or they would tell us, sorry, about addiction. We could ask questions. But it was very much a learning environment as opposed to a, a group kind of chatting environment, which worked really well for me because I'm, I like to learn. So I kind of absorbed all this information in my own time, went back to my room, did, and I got a lot of time on my own where I got to write and reflect. And um, so each day was a different topic. They would also bring in partners. So if you uh, were married or you had family that were invested, they could also come and visit and they had programs for them too. Um, the thing that was really a struggle for me was trying to convince the people in there that I wasn't going to run out and drink as soon as they took their eyes off me. Um, we were allowed to leave or some of us were allowed to leave the premises during the day, but we had to sign in and out and be breathalyzed when we came back in. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. What was the worst part of it and what was the surprising best part of it? The worst part was a moment when my the psychiatrist that I was working with um, said I could go home for the weekend in, in the middle. But he said, you need to call home and make sure that your husband has found every single hidden bottle of alcohol that you've hidden in your house. 
And I said, oh, I, I never did that. And we almost had an argument because I knew I hadn't done it, but I think with his experience and the people that he was used to dealing with, he said to me, you will have done it, you just will have forgotten. And I just sat there and I thought, what a shame. What a shame that that's the way that I was being spoken to because I think what they offer, the service they offer is really, it, as you say, it worked for me. But I had to be incredibly resilient when I was in there to, to stand my ground and to really show that you don't have to be that bad to need help. You know, you don't have to be hiding bottles of vodka in the laundry. Um, so that was the low. That was definitely the low. Um, the surprise was the people that I met in there. And I met all kinds of people, as you could imagine. Um, but most of them were just delightful. I mean, I was in rooms with um, lawyers, GPs, musicians, doctors, um, uh, busmen, you know, ev from every single walk of life were in there with exactly the same issues. And so it brought us all down to the same level. And whilst we didn't get to know one another, one another's stories particularly, we did share that common ground of, you know, I just said we just had a bit of a crappy time with alcohol or with whatever it was and we were there to sort it out. Like, what's the big deal? You know, we're human. We we may, you know, we're all we're all fallible. And let's just knock it on the head and move on. It sounds like what you're sharing is that you were <clears throat> You were the wrong demographic of client that they are used to, but you actually feel like you were in the right place for part of the time, the two weeks that you were there because it seems like you got immense benefit out of it. But all things being equal, maybe you shouldn't have actually even been there. What do you think? Is that too much? Is that is that too much of? Uh, Exaggerate. Yeah, it's, it, it's it's definitely a thought that goes through my mind on a regular basis. Is did I need to go to those extreme measures? Um, as I said earlier, there wasn't as much available, or at least I wasn't aware of the other options at the time. And I think the alcohol industry has done a great job of convincing us that. You know, you only have a problem if you've lost your job, lost your husband, lost your kids, and, you know, you're rolling in the gutter. Um, <laughs> whereas I knew I had a problem, and I say to people, I had a problem for me. It doesn't matter how much I drank. Doesn't You know, I, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. It was a problem for me, and everybody has to make that individual choice. So um, to answer your question, was it the right place? I probably would say yes, in a sense that not only did it did it mean that I gave up for good, but also I managed to get so much information. And I say, was it the right place for me? So much information about this topic that it has now led me to what I'm doing now. And the passion behind it is I don't want anyone to have to go through what I went through. I, I think there are other ways of doing this and there's better language that we can use and there's more motivation that's necessary um, as opposed to this constant focus on how the hell do I keep myself from picking up a drink, which is very much the, the way that things were in there. Mm. And I, I would add to that just quickly that um, my exuberance and excitement at not drinking was not appreciated in that forum so yeah. um no it, I was told to pipe down um and oh. again all of that has been very motivational for me to start on my own path so in actual fact the result that they're wanting you to get they don't want you to share that result that's what it seems to me while others are going through that because if you're feeling exuberant and you're feeling really good and you're feeling really positive about being alcohol free and then you're sharing that and then you're being asked not to, How is that seems like a gross contradiction to me. Yes, I think, I think it was the way 
in which it was being shared in the forum. Um, to be fair to the to the institution that I was in, I think they do an incredible job saying that. Many of the people that I met were repeat inmates <laughs> for want of a better word <laughs> um they'd gone they'd been in there three four five times and um the person that I was working with the psychiatrist was very very motivational to me in that sense of you're not that's not you that's not going to happen to you it's a very different mindset so to your point about me being the wrong demographic I I completely agree I was definitely not with my people um, and they found a lot of the other people I think found me quite confronting because, as you know, some people on this path are very attached to their problem. You know, they, they get something from being attached to their alcoholism and so I was very challenging in that context. So, so I guess the objection was if you're going to be ecstatic and exuberant, you need to be very vulnerable at the same time and share what your real issues were. Mm. And I, I think that was trying to find that balance, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say you're, you're the only person I think I've ever conversed with who has expressed a positive uh, or who had a positive, a mostly positive experience, let's say mostly positive, a mostly positive experience from doing an in-person, inpatient treatment at a, at a traditional rehab. Uh, that's not to say there aren't many, many of you. It's just I haven't conversed with those, with many of those folks. And um, <clears throat> what I'm told by, by those folks is that it kind of sounds like exactly how you just described it. You used the word an institution, inmates, like just even the fact that you use that language is is so uh, interesting to me. Like the perception I'm sure that I have and is shared by most of the listeners right now is that sounds like a prison. Like that sounds like you're depriving yourself of something. You've got to like there's body searches and they're checking your back. It's like they don't trust you. And uh to me, at least, I can only speak from my own experience. That sounds like a living hell. I would hate that. I would hate that. But I must concede, I am pleasantly surprised that you have actually that you're sharing that you had a positive experience. Now, if we look at raw statistics, I've done a lot of research on this because I I'm publishing a book in 2022, and from what I've read, the success rate. So the success rate of people who do inpatient treatment centres. And AA is about 8%. It's somewhere between 6 and 10%. So let's just call it 8 which means it has a 92% fail rate. I guess you could say use the word fail. I use the word fail cautiously because what is fail and what is success? What's failure and what's success, right? It's different for each person. But you're talking about a re repeat inmates in being in there three to five times. I'm like, when I hear that, I'm like, whatever they're teaching in that is not working. If you've got people coming back three to five times, whatever they're doing, providing an institution, coaching you in a certain way, that ain't working. Excuse my poor use of the English uh, language no, and grammar. It, it ain't working, James, obviously. I mean, I'm kind of aware of those stats in relation to AA. Um, but I think you've hit the, 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 the point of it is that what they're doing is not working. And, and I went in six months ago to discuss this with them, um, not in any, I'm no authority, I'm just an inmate, right? But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was very conscious that the language that was being used and the way that they talked to us, and I'll just give you an example, they would often say people like you cannot do X and people like you shouldn't do Y. And I think that in itself, it used to give me a shiver when they would say that in a room because they're also very clear that no one that works in that facility has ever had an addiction problem. You cannot work there if you've ever had the actual experience of being addicted to a substance. And I got into an incredibly heated debate with somebody about that particular topic because I just do, I do not want to get 
trained by a fat personal trainer. I do not want to take financial advice from somebody that's driving the shit box, excuse my French. But, you know, to be in that context and be referred to as people like you, no wonder, because people are walking around feeling different and feeling marginalised and feeling judged. Now, when it comes to me, I think um, I'm a bit of a uh, all or nothing in and out, get the job done. That's why I went into rehab because I just figured I want to get this done. I don't have time. I got two kids. I just want to go learn what I need to learn, get and have two weeks to figure this out. It worked brilliantly for me. I don't think I would recommend it to most people. Um, I think I've done a lot of personal development work and all that sort of jazz. So I kind of had tools already before I went in. But um, where I get, yeah, where I where I get frustrated was the language and the cynicism and the disbelief that I could actually be happy not drinking. Um, you know, it was very, and in AA, that's a whole nother experience. And I know it does work for work for a lot of people. But for AA, I went in with my happy self and uh, whew, didn't stay there long. Um, and I was told very gently that it was, you know, it's your first three months. You'll find out how hard it's going to be. And, you know, you'll learn. And there's you know, a little pats on the back. I was three months sober. I couldn't have been happier. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever done in my life. And to go into an environment where people were wanting me to fail, I just thought this is not for me. You know, this is not for me. It's almost like you get more attention and more comfort if you fail. It's almost like an invitation to fail so you can – look, I, 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 I'm actually re- restraining myself from sharing because I don't – maybe I should just provide this context first um, to the listener so you don't think that this is just a, a big PR exercise for what I do um, – because I am clearly biased, right? I have a program, it's called Project 90, and the method of that program based on statistics that, I, that, that, that I've tracked is that we have about an 87% success rate of folks getting to at, le- to at least 90 days on their first attempt, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I don't have exact statistics on what happens to those folks after the 90 days, I can only rely on anecdotal evidence that that includes folks that I've stayed in contact with, right? People who, and I've been running my programs now since 2015, in particular Project 90 since 2018. Most of the people who have gone through that Project 90 program have relayed to me that they are either A, still alcohol-free two years later and loving it, or B, they have a drink on occasion. But the B subsection of that is alcohol no longer has power over them. They are free to choose. Now, that may come across as like an advertisement for Project 90, which it, which it kind of is. But at the same time, here, here's why I think I that method in that program works as opposed to what we're talking about, which is the inpatient and AA. In my view, it's because Project 90 in my method is aspirational. It's positive. It's fun. It's focusing on an alcohol-free lifestyle as opposed to focusing on depriving yourself of alcohol. It's focusing on drinking clear liquids, water, soda water, rather than focusing on not drinking attractively packaged poison, which is how I refer to it refer to alcohol. Our community is very supportive and fun and we play games and we and we and we 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 post you know little video selfies in a in a video messaging app we have of people who are like of, of people hiking or fun little concoct drinks that they're making al- alcohol free drinks of course. And so it's very aspiring, right? Aspirational, I'm sorry is the right word, aspirational and uplifting. What you're sharing with me sounds to me sounds like a living hell. It's like they're saying people like you, um, the cynicism, 
um, you know, in AA, it's very much uh, having to surrender to the higher power, that like you have to surrender to this addiction. I, I call BS on all of that. Yeah. And, I, and I should say I have a great friend. She's wonderful. And she has gone through AA and it's worked for her and it's the one thing that we actually butt heads, butt heads on because she wants to defend AA until she dies. And I'm like, well, just look at the statistics. It's worked for you, but you are like the minority Statistically speaking, you're the minority of who it works for. It doesn't work for 92 out of 100 people. So I guess that's after that little spiel and rant, I'd like to just ask you, what are your thoughts on what I just shared as yeah. as it relates to the difference in how you approach yeah. alcohol and alcohol-free living? There's two things that come up for me from what you've said. The first is aspirational living and aspiration and I call it compelling sobriety even though I hate that word sobriety but that is the key to changing a habit if something is exciting and you're you want you want to move towards it and you see the benefits and you see the things that you're going to get that is what keeps momentum in my experience anytime you need to change a habit you have to find a compelling alternative otherwise you're just going to go back to the old ways. Um, and I, from looking at, and the reason we're speaking is because I, I looked into what James was doing and I just loved his message and I got in touch with him because I'm like, this is what we need. We need people talking about this in a fun way so that people look at people like James and go, I want to be like James or I want to be like Sarah <laughs> and I, I want to love my life. I want to have this freedom. To the point where, you know, we've got some incredibly bright individuals in this world who are being dulled by alcohol because they don't, they're not given that information. They just think that if they quit drinking, it's going to be like you say, a living hell. Who wants to do that? No one, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I would say is um, in relation to the types of people. And I think one thing, I'm 47 years old, I've seen and dealt with people, as I'm sure you have, from many different backgrounds. And I never judge. If it works for somebody, that's bloody brilliant. If going to AA works for you, go for it. It doesn't work for me. And I believe that there's a lot of other people who it won't work for. And those are my people. And they're the people that I'm trying to help. So um, I have no, I mean, I just steer clear of it. Um, and I know that that can be potentially a little bit polarizing in terms of the way that I speak about it. But honestly, we're all different. We're all doing the best that we can. Um, and I think that um, I know what worked for me and I know what works to change a habit. You have to be excited by it. And um, I wasn't excited by the rehab, but I was excited about the possibility of living without alcohol. Mm. When you said, <clears throat> I want to be like James or I want, to, I, I want to be like Sarah, I was imagining that Michael Jordan commercial in the 80s was like, I, I can be like Mike. Like, I want to be, want to be like, <laughs> Mike, like Mike. I was like, yeah, yeah let's make one yeah. for James. Shall we? Yeah, we'll I want to be, be like, like James. James. <laughs> That's your new ad campaign. Yeah, exactly. Well, I love what you're saying there. You know, things that it feels exciting and you're moving towards something versus moving away from something. And you must find a compelling alternative. Uh, and, and then you shared that, you know, most people think that the idea of quitting drinking is a living hell. Uh, and I know certainly what we do and what I know you do in your work is, is to try and rewire people's brain to see alcohol-free living as pure joy as opposed to quitting drinking as being, a, a, you know, pure hell. So it is a mindset shift and, and it's so simple it really, I mean, it, it really is very simple. Instead of thinking that you're depriving yourself of something, just start thinking that you're moving towards something. But that's it. Absolutely. The end. Yeah. No expensive rehabs. No. No AA meetings. No surrendering to a higher power. Not not trying putting your hand up and saying you're an alcoholic. I, I, in my opinion, and again, I'm not a doctor, so any listener here is getting triggered by this. I'm just putting the disclaimer in here. I'm not a doctor, but I, I bet that most, I can't give you exact numbers, but I, I would bet most people who are in an AA meeting saying, hi, my name's James and I'm an alcoholic, are not alcoholics. Yeah. 
as the medical community might define an alcoholic. And so it's just, it's all, not all, I'm sorry. Most of it in my view is just BS and it's keeping people stuck in shame. Yes. I couldn't yeah. agree more. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I was just briefly in an AA meeting where someone dared to say, I don't identify as an alcoholic. He came to the meeting, but he didn't want to say it. And he got blasted by the leader of the, of the group. So there is, to me, there's a danger in letting the general public run something that is so, you know, it's so, what's the word? I don't know. You need to have skills. I think when I, you know, I went in and they were jumping on me to be, you know, I'll be your sponsor, I'll be your sponsor. I'm like, well, what are your credentials? Like, I don't want to just do some 12-step, bear my soul, call my brother's mother's sister and tell her I did something without support from somebody that really knows what they're doing. I was also not very popular for that opinion, um, hence why I didn't stick around. But um, I, I totally agree in that sense that people are stuck. <laughs> they don't even know they're stuck and they create a community. And I, I, again, I will qualify this by saying not all AA groups are like this. I've heard there are some very successful ones and, as you say, work really well for some people. My experience of it was that it bred a sense of victimhood and people liked, to, not liked to, but people didn't know any different. And so they sat within that and they stay stuck. And for the rest of their lives, they say, I am an alcoholic. I've been five million days sober. Their entire life is defined by the fact that at one point they had a bit of a shitty time with alcohol. You know, I, I just don't think that that's the way to live. And I, Again, you know, I might be upsetting people, but at the end of the day, this is my opinion. This isn't fact. This is just what I think. Um, and I think that there's a need for us to try and move and shift the way that we talk about this topic so that people can start to see a light within that darkness because it's just so heavy and so dark. Mm. Sorry, I just went on a rant there, but anyway. You and me both. <laughs> this is like the James Sarah rant show. Thank you to the listener for, for sticking with us. I'm hoping you're, if you're still listening, listener, then you must be finding us engaging. You're <laughs> enjoying our little rants. Otherwise, you would have switched us off onto the radio as you're driving or running. Um, can I ask you what your thoughts are? I, I dislike very much the word sober, which is why I don't use it in any of my my coaching or my marketing, I use the phrase alcohol free. Yes. Uh, sober to me feels like you're depriving yourself of something that ordinarily you would choose. And so when people say I'm two years sober, to me, I, I experience that as being I'm two years depriving myself of something that ordinarily I would choose. Uh, whereas alcohol free to me, even though it has the word alcohol in it, it's very cha challenging to find a word to describe alcohol without actually using the word alcohol. Um, but alcohol free to me is like I'm choosing this lifestyle. I'm choosing this. I'm I'm choosing this. Sober to me means depriving yourself of something you'd ordinarily choose. Whereas alcohol free means I'm choosing to go this way. What are your thoughts on that? I I agree. Um, I've had quite a lot of conversations about this in the rebranding of my business, and I'm removing the word sober for the reasons that you describe. Um, and I think the dictionary definition is something along the lines of dull. I don't know, it's like sober equals <laughs> dull. Um, so I have an issue with that word too. And um, as I've evolved, like, uh, you know, I haven't been alcohol free for very, very, you know, less than two years, but the word sober is being removed from my vocabulary for the reasons that you explain. Um, the other words that I'm removing are alcoholic, recovery, and um, there's one more, can't think of it. Uh, another word that's just loaded, there's charge to it that's not positive. Um, but they're these words, that, I'm in recovery, and I'm, it's just all so restricted to me that it feels, you know, it's not, like you say, it's not a choice. It's a choice. You're empowered to make this choice. When you're empowered, you feel good. When you feel good, you do good stuff. You know, it's 
<laughs> to me, it makes sense that way. Yeah, the word recovery, rehab, sober, alcoholic. Yeah, I want. Them, I just want them them gone. gone. Very heavy and dark and like. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, just a reminder to the listener as well. We've got a new website. If you go to alcoholfreelifestyle dot com, by the time this episode airs, it will be it will be live. It's actually not live right now. So I was actually saying it in anticipation of when this is going to be published. But if you go to alcoholfreelifestyle dot com. You can um, get my newsletter. You can download a guide there, which uh, uh, is free, and you can get on my newsletter. So you'll get automated emails from me once every few days, and then once a week I write a weekly newsletter where I never use the word sober, recovery, alcoholic, or rehab. I only talk about all the <laughs> aspiring and beautiful things in life. So you're welcome to go and check that out. Uh, let's move towards... Uh, what life is like now? You, you're you well and truly alcohol-free. Tell us a little bit about home life, how your energy is, maybe your sleep, your outlook on life compared to what it was in the moments or in the days before you went into rehab. Yeah. Um, depression and anxiety just don't come up for me anymore, hardly ever. I'm human, so they pop up once in a while. But depression, anxiety are gone I can eat whatever I want now because I don't. Uh, my weight has just stabilised. Um, if I want to indulge in chocolate once in a while, no problem. I think that's been really cool. <laughs> um, I have clarity every day. I have purpose. I have product. Um, productivity through the roof. Like literally, brain explodes every day with ideas. Um, I'm a lot more um, happy in my relationship. With my husband, I'm a lot more present for my kids. My kids love the fact that I don't drink. They're proud of me, which is another great thing. Um, and I think I'm very discerning. I'm a lot more discerning now about what I do, how I spend my time, and who I spend my time with. Um, so my social life, although it has, aside from COVID, it has diminished in the amount of time I'm out and about when I am. It's because I'm choosing to be there. I'm choosing who I'm with. Um, and, I mean, I could go on. I could list the benefits for a good hour. I reckon I would bore you with it. But there is no downside to me to not drinking, not one. It's the best thing I ever did. And um, I just see it getting better and better. Mm, what a glowing endorsement of an alcohol-free lifestyle. That's fantastic. Mm. <laughs> what feedback do you get from family, friends, colleagues? I have made a conscious decision to not talk about it a great deal to the people close to me um, because I've done that in the past with other things and I think it's show, not tell. I don't t really bang on about it, but over the last two years, most of my friends now are either alcohol-free or on the journey, <clears throat> not because I've been telling them, but because they've seen the changes that it's made in my life. Um, anyone that asks me about it in any great detail, I know is where I was two years ago. You know, the curiosity is where you know that somebody's just thinking, man, I, I think I could look at this. So I've built some really, really great relationships with people who are curious, who just want to watch and, you know, learn. But, uh, yeah, I just think every relationship I have with another human being has been taken to a next level because I'm 100% invested in what they have to say. I'm listening, I'm present, um, and my priorities have changed. Isn't it interesting, well, sorry, it's interesting to me that uh, the greatest feedback that you've received is just seeing other people shift in their life just by mm -hmm. noticing your shift. It's not like you've been selling them on this idea. They're just noticing it in you and shifting themselves. Like you are actually a living, walking, breathing, uh, motivational tool, it seems, for, for others who are in your presence. I, that sounds very kind, I think. <laughs> I don't mean to paint myself as a as some, some sort of beaming light, but I, I just think that I mean, that's happened to me in my life. You know, I've come across people and I've gone, what are they, what are they doing? 
whether it be, you know, a fitness thing or whatever. And you look, what are they doing? And then you see, oh, she doesn't drink. And then that plants a seed. Um, and then you start to explore that. So I definitely love it when I get, and I get messages most days and strangely from people I haven't come across in years who they've seen my Instagram post or whatever they've seen and they've gone, oh my God, I've been thinking about doing this. What are the steps? What should I do? Um, and that is just so, to me, it's just, um, yeah, it's really, really cool. Mm. Tell us a little bit about Sober Upside and your Instagram account. Yeah, so uh, I'm going through a big rebrand at the moment. So uh, Sober Upside is going to go as well. In, and it's all turning into tapped in to a healthier, happier lifestyle without alcohol. Um, and my goal is to create a bit of a hub here in Australia for um, people wanting to explore an alcohol-free lifestyle with events and drinks and all sorts of bits and pieces related. So it's going to be a fun kind of resource. Um, behind that, uh, the Sober Sommelier, which is also going to die. The Sober Sommelier must die, I was told by my branding person. Um, that uh, that has really focused on our coffee alternatives. Um, and I'm now working with, um, with, I think I told you, some companies that are wanting to bring that into their organisations. I'm, I'm le- working with a lot of the brands running petitions to get alcohol-free products into venues, hospitality venues, which I'm very passionate about. Um, and uh, the Sober Sommelier uh, Instagram will just – I actually, honestly, I have no bloody clue where that's going to go. But, you know, I just post up the alcohol-free drinks that I like and it's a bit of fun. So, Fantastic. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing some time with me here on the podcast. If you're the listener, go ahead and follow Sarah on Instagram uh, and thank you for sharing about what goes on inside of a, a rehab treatment center that was that really opened opened my eyes and I I I like the fact that um, you got such positive benefits from it even if you shared that you disagreed with a lot of the methods that they were instilling in there so that was really nice to hear um, yeah anything else that you would like to share to to the listener or anything just to kind of sum up what we've talked about here? Oh, look, I think you've just got to follow your own path and just find someone that you re- resonate. I hate that word. Someone that you connect with, someone that I was about to say resonate. Sorry, I've just, <laughs> that's another word I have an issue with. Um, but yeah, find your tribe, find your people, um, surround yourself with um, like-minded people that get you and support you and um and then focus on the upsides because that's the way to keep keep it going and keep keep a lasting change so that's yeah that's it for me thank you very much for having me uh you're welcome thank you for being here and if you're listening and you'd like to learn more about the alcohol-free lifestyle like i said check out (laughs) alcoholfreelifestyle.com if you're in the u.s on a mobile phone right now uh and you'd like to speak to one of my coaches and have a complimentary coaching call just to see whether our Project 90 experience might be for you, then you can text me at the number 44222. Just text me the word Project 90 and I will send you back uh, a link where you can book a call and speak to one of our coaches. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast. I want to load you up with some free stuff right now. So if you want to go to jameswanick.com slash guide, I will send you my Quit Alcohol Guide, which has helped six-figure entrepreneurs and top professionals reduce or quit drinking. You can also text the word quit guide to the number 44222 if you're in the US, of course. It doesn't really work anywhere outside of the US. But if you're in the US on your mobile phone and you'd like that guide, text the word quit guide to the number 44222 or you can go to jameswanick.com slash guide. If you'd like to schedule a free 15-minute call with one of my top coaches, just an exploratory call to see if or how we can help you, then you can go to jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90 to the number 44222 if you're listening in the US on a mobile phone. That's jameswanick.com slash schedule, or you can text the word project90, that's one word, project90, to the number 44222. 
feel free to send me a direct message over on my Instagram account, which is at James Swanick. You can also watch video episodes of this podcast and a series of other educational videos on my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick One, or you can direct message me on Facebook at James Swanick Official. And finally, a request. Would you please now write a short review of the podcast inside of the Apple Podcast app on your phone or on iTunes on your desktop? Computer. Would you please give the show five stars and write a quick one or two sentence review? This will help the show get in front of even more listeners, potentially transforming someone's life. You can rate and review the show inside of your Apple Podcast app on your phone or over on iTunes on your desktop. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you next time.